Hi, welcome back to Sound and Voltage. I'm Jeff. In the last video, I kicked off a bit of a DIY odyssey by building a few passive malts. Today, I'm going to continue that by looking at three DIY mixers made by the same company, AI Synthesis. All of these are pretty small. These aren't the big end of chain mixers that support multiple racks. Instead, they only have like three inputs, sort of utility mixers. They might be sub mixers for a particular rack or to manage a small set of voices before going to the main mixer. Because they're so small, they're really easy to build. I built all three of these over a couple of days. I think they took 60 to 90 minutes each and, and that's while I was trying to capture footage of it. One of the questions that I wanted to answer though really came into focus as I was building them. They all look very similar, so why do we need three? Why did the manufacturer decide that we needed three different mixers? And that's really what we're gonna look at today. What are these three mixers? How are they different? When would you choose one over the others? And we're actually gonna see that some of these designs go back to the 60s and 70s. Let's start with this one. This is the AI002 audio and CV mixer. This one's unique among the three because it's the only one that actually says it's for control voltage. There are two reasons for that. The first is that the mixer is, as they say, DC coupled. If it were AC coupled, then the DC component of the signal, and that's basically the control voltage, is filtered out. By being DC coupled, the mixer can process both CV and audio. The next couple mixers are gonna show us the difference. There's a second reason why it's good for CV processing, and that's because it uses operational amplifiers, or op amps, as the core of the audio processing. The other mixers we're gonna look at are discrete, made with no ICs, but when you want perfect voltage reproduction, op amps are the way to go. Let's take a look at the schematic for this mixer. You can tell just looking at it, there isn't that much going on, but let's take it piece by piece. Here at the left is the input stage of the circuit. There's the three jacks for the inputs and then three potentiometers for scaling the incoming signal. Then each one goes through a resistor that does a few different things. For one, it helps keep the inputs from interacting with each other. On the other side, there's the output stage. That's just a resistor in the output jack. You're gonna see in a bit that those two parts are almost identical between all three mixers. So let's concentrate on the interesting bits in the middle. You've got these two triangles at the center of it. These are the op amps. Each one takes two inputs labeled positive and negative, and it has an output. A bit counterintuitively, we're gonna use the negative input, which is going to have the effect of inverting the combined input signal. The ratio of these 100K ohm resistors before the signal is mixed, and the value of the output mix potentiometer is what scales the signal up and down in response to turning that potentiometer. And then we roll immediately into the next op amp, which does the same thing, and that's gonna invert the signal back again. And that seems weird, right? Why invert it at all if we're just gonna invert it back again? There's actually kind of a rat's nest there. I started researching it and rapidly I cut to the answer because it's easier this way. So I guess that's good enough. If this was just audio, leaving it inverted wouldn't matter so much, but this is also meant to be a CV mixer. So sending it back the right way up is preferable and the chip has two op amps right there. So might as well use them. But now you see how this mixer works. The inputs are brought together, scaled by the individual input pots, then they're mixed together and sent into an inverting amplifier circuit that scales the output based on the uh, output mix pot, and then it's sent into another inverting amplifier to reinvert the signal, where it's then sent to the output jack. And now you know how the majority of inexpensive mixers work. For instance, here's a schematic for a mixer from Bifaco. A lot of this should be pretty familiar now. Here are the four inputs and the pots for each. And here are the two inverting amplifiers. There's a couple of other things to notice. Uh, first, notice that there's no output mix level on this mixer, or there'd be a potentiometer here instead of this fixed 10K resistor. The other thing to notice is here, they've actually got two output jacks. One of them just outputs the inverted signal coming out of the first op amp. The second one comes out of the second inverting circuit like usual. So now if you see a mixer that has both normal and inverted inputs, that's how it's done. And then there's this section here that doesn't appear in the AI synthesis module. The Bifaco mixer has a red-green LED indicator for output level, and this is the circuitry that enables it. Neat. Okay, so that's an op-amp driven mixer. But what are the other two mixers that I built? Well, this is an interesting one here. This is the AI synthesis AI022 harmonic mixer. What does it have going on under the hood? Let's check the schematic for this one. There's a lot here that looks familiar, isn't there? Here on the left, we've got the three inputs and their associated pots and resistors. Over on the right is the output stage. 
So that leaves the bit here in the middle. And you can see the output potentiometer down here just before the output. But what's with the rest of it? This symbol here, if you're not already familiar with it, is a transistor. There are four of them, and they're all wired together in this interesting way. I'd love to be able to tell you what they're all doing, but I have no idea. I can explain to you how the IC functions, but that's about the limit of my ability. But you know who could have told us? Bob Moog. Because this is the basic design for the CP3 mixer that was part of the early Moog designs. It was credited for giving the Moog sound some of its power. Because it wasn't just the famous Moog filter that was coloring the output of the oscillators, but this mixer as well. As opposed to the first mixer that was designed to be super clean and not affect the input, this mixer does something interesting to the sound. See, there's a reason why AI Synthesis calls this the harmonic mixer, because it's adding additional harmonics into the sound. The mixer itself is making the sound richer. So time for a demo. First, I'm going to demonstrate the behavior of the first mixer. In green is the output from the new system's instrument's harmonic shift oscillator, and I'm feeding that into the mixer, and the output of it is in blue. And you can hardly see the blue waveform because it's exactly the same as the input in green. Now let's move over to do the same test with the harmonic mixer. The first thing to note is that there's this extra knob labeled bias. If we look back at the schematic now, you can see it up here, and it appears to be just adding voltage into the signal, and that's exactly what it's doing. So I'm going to start by setting the bias knob so that the zero line of the mixer output lines up with the original waveform. And now when I bring up the input, you can see that it's staying exactly the same. So far, it's just what we saw before. And this is what would happen in a lot of these types of mixer. There'd be a trimmer on the back of the module that would be calibrated to get it just right. But sometimes designer will leave it open as something we can play with. Let's see why. Now listen here as I dial the bias up. We hit this point where the voltage gets clipped, cutting off the top of the waveform, and that's going to change the quality of the sound. We're effectively changing what the waveform is. It's no longer a sine wave, so it sounds different. I'm going to change the scale of the signal on the scope so that you can see it's not just a matter of it hitting the top of the display. And when we look at the spectrum, you can see that it's adding a little something down here besides the single peak of the original frequency. Now as I switch back and forth, you can see that the sound coming out of the mixer is adding a few higher harmonics, and there's even a bit of one that's lower. This changes the character of the sound and adds some richness in some cases and increases the low end in other cases, which is where some of that oomph that Moogs can have comes from. Ah, but it gets weirder. Because as we crank the mix level up to the top and bring the bias all the way down, something crazy happens. Yikes, what the heck is that? Well, that's the sound of all those transistors going into saturation and suddenly becoming non-linear. All bets are off at this point. Check out the spectrum. It's harmonics all over the place. This is a bit hard to think of as musical, maybe, but whenever you have a lot of harmonics, that's where a filter really shines. So let's take this bonkers output and patch it into the three sisters here and play with it a bit. What's crazy about this is that it all started off as just a sine wave. We're not feeding it a complex waveform, but we're getting all of this out of the mixer.
I'm going to set up the scope so we can see the results of the filtered spectrum here. Clearly, this is a mixer that was intended to be explored and used as part of the sound generation process, not just something sitting there to mix signals together. Now let's take a look at what the waveform looks like. You can see that when the bias is all the way down, we get that same clipping from before, except now it's on the bottom, but we also turn into a square wave for part of the cycle. And it's interesting to see what the filtered waveform looks like, and how it follows, or doesn't follow in some cases, the underlying waveforms that created it, and how it changes when the filter sweeps. Okay, that's enough of the harmonic mixer. Let's check out the last of the three for the day. This is the AI-106 West Coast mixer. Why West Coast? We'll get to that in a second, but let's first look at the schematic. If we take out the middle section, you'll see the same basic inputs and outputs that we've seen in every mixer, but looking in the middle, you see a simpler design than we saw in the last one. There's only two transistors, and they're not nearly as complexly interconnected. So back to that West Coast thing. The model's ID number is a bit of a hint for where this came from, because one of the early mixers used in Buchla synthesizers was the 106, and indeed this is the same basic design. Here's a schematic for the Buchla 106. It was a six input mixer with two groups of three with their own outputs, so I'm just going to blank out the second set of three. And then there was some additional circuitry to output the full mix of the six, and I'm just going to block that out. Now the structure starts to look familiar with what we just saw. There's two transistors and this capacitor here. That capacitor is interesting, actually. This is what's AC coupling the mixer, so it wouldn't work as a CV mixer. And that's a telling design choice. Mukla didn't like people mixing audio with CV, and the designs evolved to not allow that to happen. Firing it up on the scope shows something interesting. The output is inverted. There's the input in green and the output in blue. That can actually be kind of useful in comparing what's happening with this mixer, because it's more subtle than the last one. I had to work with it a bit to get to a good example, but you can see here that the waveforms aren't the same anymore. The output in blue has some of that clipping going on that we saw with the harmonic mix. And that's reflected here in the spectrum. I can switch back and forth and you can see the ratio of the harmonic starts to change. Some additional ones are added, some are dropping. So again, we're seeing where the mixer is adding its own character to the sound. Well, I guess that's about all I had to say about mixers. I hope that coming out of this video, you've gained a bit of an appreciation for the different designs and how they produce different results. I came into this thinking that a mixer is a mixer is a mixer, and boy did I prove myself wrong. Plus these three were just fun to build. If you've got any DIY urges at all, these are great modules for novices. Each one only took an hour to build and you can do your own exploration and everyone can always use an extra mixer. And that wraps it up for this video. I hope you found it helpful, and if you've managed to make it all the way to this point, maybe consider subscribing. It really helps out the channel. Thanks.